we're looking at what Christ is dealing with here in his final days on this earth. And by way of introduction, you know that if you've been around for any length of time, that life poses us with all kinds of tough questions. Jesus lived a life just like you and I, not in the same exact way, but it was human, and he too was faced with difficult questions. And one of those questions has come upon him even this morning. In verse 15, where we begin, it says that the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk, and so they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. And before we even get to the question that they're going to ask of him, I want you to notice right off the bat here that uh, this is the Pharisees that are behind the interrogation. If you know anything about the Pharisees, you understand that these are the nation's top thinking religious elite. These guys know the ins and outs of their culture and their religion. And they have been with Jesus or tagging along for several years now, and they have become a bit weary of his presence, and now they have convened to entangle Jesus, uh, which means to trap him or uh, lay a snare for him. The original word literally means it's uh, an attempt to elicit from someone a remark that can be turned into an accusation against that person. They're laying a trap. And the reason is is because Jesus has just finished in the weeks that we've um, been studying together. He's just finished humiliating these guys with three devastating parables in a row all of which they knew clearly were being spoken against them. So they have to just put an end to this. Our Bible stops with three because they went away. If they had stuck around, you got to wonder how long would Jesus have given parable after parable to just lambast these guys. And so they now have disappeared into private quarters uh, to convene with one another and decide how they might entangle Jesus. They're plotting to set a a trap, and uh, it it reminds us of what we may be familiar with all the way back in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 says that the rulers plot together against the Lord and His anointed, referring specifically to Christ, saying, let's free ourselves from slavery to God. See, so that's exactly what's happening here. They feel as if they are under Christ's absolute domain. They don't like it. They're being attacked by him. They don't appreciate it. So they plot together, just as was predicted of them in Psalm chapter 2, to free themselves from the tyranny, the slavery, the oppression of this Christ. And so they have gone to some separate area of the courtyard proper and in the temple there in the temple area Uh, they've escaped christ's presence and now now they're uh, having a a quick meeting how much time they spent plotting i don't know doesn't tell us uh but it does tell us that they did it so it was enough for matthew to mention that they did go out and they plotted Uh, how much time did they need we don't know we only know that they took as much time as they felt that was needed to devise the question of questions. They are careful and calculated. They're deliberating for a certain amount of time to come up with some kind of a question that would be impossible for Jesus to answer without incriminating himself in front of everybody. And that's exactly what they're hoping to do. And again, these are the top minds in the religious world that are formulating some kind of a riddle, uh, you know, a deep philosophical question to hopefully baffle Jesus, who, might I add, is the author of life. They're going to stump him, put him in a position where he can't answer without getting himself in trouble. Okay? And they're in this together. They're in this together. Uh, it tells us uh, in uh, verse 16 that these Pharisees even recruited the help of their own students, okay? their disciples, 
along with the Herodians. It, it tells us here in verse 16, they, they sent to him with their disciples and the Herodians. Now, it's interesting because uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians were avowed enemies. They hated each other, and this, this hatred had, had been for some time now. <clears throat> the Herodians, we don't know a whole lot about them, but we do know that they were corrupt. Of course, they're all corrupt. However, they're notoriously corrupt. They're very liberal, very worldly, and here's the, the key ingredient. They were very pro-Roman. They were a, a political party that had, uh, they, they fully backed uh, Roman occupation. Uh, they were Herodians, so Herod had their full support, and Herod was uh, an uh, Edomian king that had been appointed by the Roman government to have jurisdiction over this area. They fully supported him. They were full, full support of the Roman government, and so they were, they were pro-tax. They were in favor of taxes. Like, that, that's beyond our ability to fathom, isn't it? Like, who's pro-taxes? <clears throat> These guys were, if you can imagine that. Pharisees were kind of on the other end of the spectrum. They were... In sharp contrast to the Herodians, Pharisees were Jewish patriots. They loved their country, and for that reason, they hated Rome. They weren't corrupt and liberal. They were super ultra-Orthodox. These guys were as moral as they came, or so they thought. They abide by the letter of the law, and they're all goody-two-shoes. They were very anti-Roman. So you've got the Herodians, pro-Roman, pro-tax, and you've got the Pharisees, anti-Roman, anti-tax. And suddenly now they're teaming up together. Isn't this interesting? Very significant for us that they're now starting to cooperate with one another. I think the reason is, is because nothing quite unites two opposing political parties like an anti-Christ campaign, if I may say so. Uh, and we'll see if the future doesn't uh, reveal that that's maybe got a prophetic ring to it. Uh, nothing would bring the Democrats together with the Republicans in our country like a good anti-Christ campaign. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but at any rate here, <clears throat> these guys are on the hunt. And so they team up together. They send out their best. They have put together their, their minds and they have come up with a, a question of questions that's going to put Jesus in a bad spot. And they, they arrive there back at the temple where Jesus still is, uh, teaching and, and all, with a very familiar tactic. They're going to use a strategy that all of us are familiar with because we've all either been on the receiving end of it or the, the giving end of it. And it's a tactic that we call flattery. I don't know if you're familiar with flattery and how it works. But let's read about it in verse 16. They sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, <clears throat> now I'm going to read a little tone into this just so you guys get the flattery behind it. Oh, teacher, oh, we know that you are true. You hearing it? <laughs> it's gross. It should make you gag just a bit, not enough to make a mess. But teacher, oh, and remind yourselves that these guys hate Jesus and they're setting a trap. They want him dead. But listen to their words. We know that you're true and teach the way of God and truth, nor do you care about anyone because you don't, you don't regard the person of men. Yeah. You, you, don't, you don't care what other people think of you. You just say it like it is. Mm -hmm. we, we know that about you, and that's great, and that, that's just wonderful, and that's just blatant flattery is what that is. So if we were to define flattery in non-dictionary terms, I'll tell you that flattery, by logic, is a disguise. You're not who we think you are, you flatterer. And the Bible tells us that flattery is a disguise. Psalm 55, 21 says that flatterers use words that are, quote, smooth as butter even though their heart is war. Their words are as soothing as oil, <laughs> but underneath are daggers. You get the point. Flattery is, is a disguise. I would say that flattery is like a fishing lure. Does anybody in here like to fish? Come on, raise your hand. It's okay. 
I'm going to put mine down as soon as you raise yours because I don't fish, but some do. That's fine. Most of us at, at least be familiar with what a fishing lure is. A fishing lure is a small device used by hungry people who assume their victims are stupid. Listen to this. Romans 16, 18 says, People use flattery, don't serve Jesus, but their own appetites. They're hungry. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. They think their victims are stupid. So flattery is like a fishing lure, and flattery is like a disguise, and flattery is deceptive. What pretends to be a concern for and admiration of somebody else is really a preoccupation with self. That's what it is. Flattery is used by those who love themselves the most. It's veiled hatred is what flattery is. Psalm 26, 28 says, A lying tongue hates its victims. And again, the word victim. So uh, flattery is deceptive. One more. Flattery is an attempt to put your enemy on as high a pedestal as you can manage. Build them up and pump their ego and get them as up above as you can just so that you can have the pleasure of watching them fall because you know they will. And again, Psalm 62, verse 4 says, Their plan is to thrust someone down from a high position. They bless with their mouths while inwardly they curse. It's a description of flattery. Builds you up only to knock you down. That's their goal. And so the Bible has nothing flattering to say about flattery. And you need to know that because um, you will be on the receiving end of it. And God help you, you're on the giving end. You, you flatter people. Be careful. Be very careful of doing that. There's no reason for it. There's no sense in it. And Jesus takes no pleasure by it. <clears throat> but the reason that these guys are using it here in chapter 22 is because they want to put Jesus at ease about offending whichever political party they're going to end up offending when he gives a, an answer to their question. They want to put him at ease. Hey, you don't care what people think, so just say it like it is. We got a question for you, by the way. They want to put Jesus at ease by assuring him that they all find his, his social bravery, the ability to tell it like it is, they all find that rather commendable. Boy, we wish we, we, wish we were more like you, like, you know, just you're able to speak your mind and tell the truth. And I mean, we all recognize that that's, that's you and that's commendable. And, and so... <clears throat> here's, our, here's our question. And by the way, they're saying this to Jesus, uh, not just to hopefully pump up Jesus' ego, like usually works with regular human beings. doesn't work with Jesus. Uh, but generally speaking, a person who's flattered allows it to, to have its full effect by, by letting it get to their head. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, you're cute. Oh, you're great. Oh, you're awesome. Oh, you want to be on my team? I, 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 blah, 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 blah. And you're like, <laughs> by the time you're walking away from that conversation, you're like, I am pretty awesome. I am handsome. No, you're not. They're just, they're doing that to you. And uh, it's not going to work on Jesus, though. That's one of the reasons, no doubt, they're trying is to pump him up. The other reason they're doing it is so that um, the, the, the crowds in the temple can be reminded of what Jesus' reputation is. Hey, um, we know that you tell the truth, right? Don't we? Uh, and, and that you don't care about what anybody thinks. You're just going to tell like it is. Right, right, guys? Right, right. Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay, so, so then out with the question. And they want everybody to remember what Jesus is known for so that if he fails to uphold the reputation he thus far has in the face of intimidation, because he's going to be intimidated by our question, then he looks like a coward. <laughs> or if he acts according to his reputation and tells it like it is, he's in trouble. <laughs> so here's our question, Jesus. Now that we've set the trap, put out the bait, here's our question. Tell us, therefore, in verse 17, what do you think? And by the way, I'll bet you these guys are just thrilled. They are convinced in their minds at this point that they've got him. This is it. This is the end of our troubles. 
either he's going to offend the Herodians and Rome is going to crucify him, or he's going to do it wrong for the Pharisees and, and we're going to stone him. Either way works for us. They're excited. And if I might add, a bit proud of themselves. They think they're so clever. A little pinch of flattery along with a quarter cup of deceit and some good old-fashioned lying. We got him. So tell us, therefore, <clears throat> what do you think? <clears throat> is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Like, you know, this has just been kind of a thing with us. We just, we're just looking for answers. We just want, you know, just wondering what you think. You can see him waiting, drooling like a dog, waiting to eat. The word pay that they use there. <clears throat> Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? It simply means give. Okay? Not hang on to that because it's significant and I'll get to it. It just seems they're asking if they should give, give their money to Caesar. And this is significant to them because, correct me if I'm wrong, nobody likes giving their money to the government. I'm just going out on a limb. Am I right? Or, yeah, a little bit. No, nobody, you know, come tax time is like, yeah! <laughs> nobody likes giving their money to the government. But for these guys, it was particularly bother, bothersome, and I'll exp explain why. <clears throat> um, they had all kinds of taxes, just like anybody would. They had sales taxes. They had customs to pay. They had all kinds of this and that. Um, but the tax that they're referring to in verse 17 is a particular one, which was what's called a poll tax. A poll tax was an annual tax of one denarius, which, if I'm not mistaken, was like a day's wage, so 80 bucks, 120 bucks, or uh, whatever you make now. Uh, a day's wage <clears throat> per individual Jew. So the Gentile Romans occupied their territory and began to tax them just for being them. It had nothing to do with them making a sale or buying a product. It just was, you're Jewish? Denarius, once a year. <clears throat> and and, and um, for reasons of keeping the peace and because of the easily offended Jewish sensibilities the Romans were kind enough, if you can use that word to describe the Romans back then, they were kind enough to actually use coins, copper coins, for them to pay their sales taxes and things like that, um, that weren't really offensive to the Jews. They didn't have the, a picture of the Roman emperor on there. It wasn't Caesar's picture, and it didn't say Caesar is God or son of God or nothing. You know, like all the things that would really bother a Jew. They made special coins for the Jews to use to pay them with the, what they needed to pay. Um, but not this one. This one was a silver coin, and it did, the denarius did have a picture of Caesar on it, and it did say, Son of God. And so for the Jews to have those coins in their possession, to pay taxes with it, to use them like that, I mean, it was just blasphemy, the things that that coin stood for. So this was really um, particularly troubling to them. And uh, they took issue with this for many reasons. Um, 25 years earlier, here's a piece of trivia for you, because we love trivia. In 6 AD, the Romans initiated that head count. You know, it's a census. That's when they count everybody. We do it here. They took a census in order to tax the people. And at that time, there was a man named Judas of Galilee. Don't get that confused with the Judas that we all know about. This was just some dude that you've probably never heard about unless you've read Acts chapter 5, verse 37. <laughs> it mentions him in there, and it says that at the census that this man uh, <clears throat> kind of rose up and started a revolt because he really didn't like taxes. And so he gathered a few people around him, but he was killed. Again, Acts 5.37 just explains it in brief. And so this was Judas the Galilean. He got killed in that revolt. 
uh, but his spirit lived on. This kind of kind of spearheaded a sort of movement, anti-tax movement among the Jewish people, and particularly, I believe, it was members of his family carried on with that tradition, and they, of course, gathered uh, allegiance with others in that community who were just kind of like sick of taxes and didn't like this whole thing. They became known as, guess what? Zealots. All right, you've heard that word, zealots. They were, these were zealots. And, uh, and it was uh, this group of individuals who had become loosely termed by that name. Uh, it was a, a political faction that sought to, I mean, they were nationalist, very patriotic. They were kind of terrorists, if you, if you want to think about that way. They were armed. Uh, these were proud card-carrying members of the NSA, you know, the National Sword uh, Association. And these were the bad boys of their culture. Uh, they were known for starting fights and fires and disturbances all over the place. Um, they would not have hesitated to storm the Capitol on January 6th or any other day of the week if they had to. You follow me? Um, so this isn't too far-fetched of an illustration. These people are all over, all over the place. Uh, and their, their goal was to take back Israel from the Romans. Uh, at any rate, and I'm not, I'm not making fun of any group. I'm going, we can see that that spirit is still alive, right? And it's not isolated to Israel. So uh, whatever. But by this time, the time of Christ, which is now 30 AD, so you're talking two and a half decades later, <clears throat> uh, the, the tax issue had become a very heated one because it blended moral convictions with political passion. That's a dangerous combination. That's like mixing hydrogen peroxide with whatever makes hydrogen peroxide go berserk. I'm not a chemist, but you get it? <laughs> it's the two things you pour into the, the homemade volcano to make it bubble. Right? Right? lethal combination. And that encapsulates the cultural climate, the setting of this question. It was about taxes. And the issue of taxes had fractured the relig religious community in their day. And if we're looking for a parallel to that, it has, it's really very similar uh, to what the issue of mask wearing and vaccines has done in the modern church, wouldn't you say? Because you're blending the same two ingredients, moral conviction and political passion. And people seem to be taking sides over the issue, just like they did back then. If you're anti-tax, you stand on that side of the white line. If you're pro-tax, you stand on that side of the white line. And whatever side you stand on makes the people on the other side automatically your enemy. No matter what else they believe, no matter, it's just that one issue. Where do you stand? And we see this all the time. In the church, in the homeschool community, anything that has religion and politics kind of attached to it, there seems to be this same spirit that we have to deal with whether it was 2,000 years ago or in our own age. <clears throat> but Jesus now is, is having to uh, pick one side or the other because he's being faced with a yes or no question, isn't he? It's a yes or no question, Jesus. What do you think? Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Yes or no? And people just get so worked up about this. And so this was, their, this was the perfect opportunity for these guys to corner Jesus on a controversial issue. Make him answer yes or no. Force him to take sides. It's perfect because if he sides with the Herodians, he becomes an enemy of the Jews and loses his support with the whole crowd. If he takes the sides of the Pharisees, he becomes an enemy of the state and is liable to Roman execution. So, again, they, they got him either way, and they're just delighted by this. But Jesus perceived their wickedness in verse 18. So this, this isn't even sincere. What you're doing isn't... Ho, 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 ho. Jesus can see through the veneer, and he says, Why do you test me? You hypocrites! Now, you remember, these aren't the Pharisees themselves that Jesus has just been blasting with parable after parable. These are just some students that he may have never met. 
There's some younger folks still in training. And he's like, you're hypocrites. What? Us? We don't know. You're just, dude, they told us to ask. And he says, you're wicked. You're hypocrites. He says, show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, then render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. <laughs> and everybody went, what? You can't do that. It's interesting, by the way. Jesus says, <clears throat> Show me the tax money. What's the tax money? What's the name of the coin? I already told you. You can say it. Denarius. Show me the tax. He's going, who here has got a denarius? And they're like, I got one. How, notice how quickly they're able to furnish a denarius when asked. Now, I thought that this was such an offense to them to, to even think about that they couldn't fathom paying somebody with it. Lo and behold, they, they got a few in their pocket, though. Now, you need a denarius here. What? Jesus right then could have went, you guys are just, just by the power of God. You know, if he had a temper, he would have done it, but he's controlled, he's calculated, and you need to remember that by the time we get into chapter three. Jesus says, well, let's see the coin, and they show it to him. Now, you remember how I told you in verse 17 that the word that they used in the question when they said pay, you know, should we pay? That just means give. Should we give Caesar our money? And Jesus, in verse 21, says, render. He doesn't say pay what belongs to Caesar. He uses a different word altogether, translated into English as render, and it means something quite different than pay. Render means give back. So they're like, should we give our money to Caesar, and he says, give back what belongs to him already. Never was yours. Now that changes everything. Because all along they had been paying their taxes with money that they assumed was their own. And Jesus sees it entirely different. So just so you're aware, that applies to our own situation where you think your money is yours and by God's perspective, he's saying, it isn't at all. So stop acting like it is. And some of us are as possessive of our money as the Pharisees were back then. Jesus goes, that ain't your money. And by the way, if you want Jesus to prove it, he certainly could. He certainly could. You know that with the snap of a finger, Jesus could cripple you and your hospital bills will quickly drain everything that you've got and you're sunk in debt. Half of us are in debt anyway and we don't really care about what Justin is saying right now. But you have to understand that the money that you have was given to you by God. You're like, uh uh-uh, I work for it. I got an education, I got a good job and I earned it. And the Bible tells us back in the Old Testament that God actually is the one who gave you the ability to get money and he put you in a culture that has currency and he gave you the aptitude to hold a job. So don't start taking credit for what isn't yours to take credit for, which is precisely the mistake they made. They thought it was their money. Uh, should we give Caesar our money? And Jesus goes, you ought to give back what already belongs to him. So that's why he says render or give it back. And that really puts a new spin on things, both for them and for us. And I already said that the money that you have right now isn't yours. Whatever's in your pocket, whatever's in your wallet or purse, whatever's in your bank account, whatever you have to your name, it doesn't belong to you. It's just your turn to use it. <clears throat> Did you know that about money? Whatever money you've got right now isn't yours. It's just your turn to use it. You'll spend it. It'll go to somebody else. It's their turn now, isn't it? And so it just cycles through everybody's dirty hands. That's why your mom told you never lick a dollar, right? Don't put that quarter, get that quarter out of your mouth. The government, whether it was their government or our government, they're the ones who printed the money, minted the coins, put everything into circulation. It's true, and we need to think about it like that. Otherwise, we're going to end up offending Jesus like they did. So if a person wants to receive 
This is just logic. Let me give you a little bit of logic. If a person like you or me or them, if, if you want to live in any given culture and receive all the benefits that go along with that country's economic structure, then you had better be willing to gladly pay, repay, give back all financial compensation to that government for the services that you've been using. And you don't get to pick and choose. You want your tax money to go to road reparation because nobody likes potholes, but you don't want it to go to the local school because you don't have kids. Tough. Government decides where your tax money goes, not you. Yours is to give it back. They're the ones that made it possible for you to earn a wage in the first place. If you don't like that, then get out of this culture's economic system. Go off the grid. Grow your own food. Stop shopping at the supermarket then. Sew your own clothes. Grow your own cotton. Weave your own fabric. Sew your own clothes. You're on your own. But as soon as we start tapping into what the government affords us, which, by the way, includes stuff like police, and I know that we live in a culture that's really backwards, but we should kind of appreciate law and order, Thanks to the cops who make it possible for me to not get stabbed to death for what's not in my wallet. Thanks to the government for, yeah, you drop on the floor and you call 911, they're there in a heartbeat. Why? Because they care. Your government actually cares. We got this high and mighty attitude that says, well, my government sucks. Then go away. It's not for us to critique what the world does with the money that they made. And this is the problem with these guys is they, they have it all wrong. And I think this, <laughs> this passage, I was going to actually try and go through the whole rest of the chapter this morning. And I thought, I'm going to slow down and just talk about taxes. I'm not even that political, but <clears throat> apparently we get kind of wonky about this and, and it's nothing new. And so Jesus is hoping to set these guys straight because of how crooked they are. But nevertheless, we might, uh, even some of you may, and even if you don't, there are plenty of people in Christendom, as we speak, uh, within the church, that would object, even in our own culture, to paying taxes for moral reasons. I mean, it's not that, like, I'm greedy for money and I don't like giving up money, you know, and I'd rather not. I mean, lots of people hate that. Uh, But for some people, they they suppose that they've, it's their moral convictions. And they have a hard time paying taxes and stuff like that because they know what their tax dollars are going to be used for, and it's not just filling potholes, right? Uh, It bothers their conscience to know that, you know, we may be funding abortions. That's, that bothers me. Like, my tax dollars are going to s- directly promote immorality in our country. Uh, the building, they have the same issues. Their tax dollars, what were their tax dollars being used for by Rome? Building pagan temples, temples to Caesar, places where they had to sacrifice and worship people and demons. Like, no clear thinking Christian would ever want that to happen. That's not ideal. <clears throat> they were funding questionable military operations that they hated. Like, we don't always appreciate what our military is doing, or we might agree or disagree with what our government is choosing to involve itself with in foreign affairs, and we know our tax dollars. And so some people would object for, for moral reasons, but you have to understand something. Just because you financially support, by way of taxes, A wicked government, and yes, our government is wicked. It doesn't mean you endorse that wickedness. So you can pay your taxes. Jesus just liberates us to go on doing what is necessary to keep the IRS off our back. So pay your taxes. Yeah, but what if it goes to fund like wickedness? Doesn't matter. Just don't do the wickedness yourself. So your tax dollars might be going to fund partial birth abortions. Okay, just don't have one. Okay? 
That, that's that's the, the rationale here. So now if we go on using this moral conviction excuse uh, to justify any governmental rebellion, Jesus won't endorse that. And so he says, pay to Caesar what's Caesar's. And oh, that bothered some people. But then he adds a tagline, if you notice. And render to God what's God's. Give back to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God? Or let me put it this way. <clears throat> if what belonged to Caesar was that which had his image on it, what belongs to God? What has God's image on it? You. That's the answer. You do. You were made in God's image. So give back to him what's rightfully his, which is you, you, your time, your body, your life, and yes, your money. And it is to be given accordingly. And so Jesus says, render to God the things that are God's. Some people have problem paying taxes. Other people can pay their taxes without a second thought. It's rendering to God. That's the problem for some people. But there's a balance that's being given here, and thank God for that. Um, if we abide by the principle that Jesus lays down in this passage, you will find that you will be honored as, I believe, a fine, upstanding citizen. I really do. Um, <clears throat> to give to Caesar or render to Caesar makes you a loyal citizen. But to only render to Caesar and not to God makes you a loyal citizen, but a really horrible Christian. So you need to render to God as well. Um, but you have to render to God as well as rendering to Caesar, because if you only render to God, that might make you a, a pretty decent Christian, so you think. But in actuality, it's making you, one, an un unlawful citizen, as well as now a disobedient Christian. So you're not as good of a Christian as you would think you are by withholding money from a wicked government. When we do both, render to whom we must, makes you a top-notch citizen and a commendable Christian. And that's what God desires. We're to obey our government up to the point that it requires us to disobey God. Only at that point do we become rebels, so to speak. Okay? Okay. Honor the emperor, the Bible says. Paul tells us to aim to live a peaceable life. <clears throat> Many insist even today that their money belongs to God, and um, we would agree with that. But the long and the short of it here is that God is commanding us to pay the government with it. Uh, he says what he does and then concludes with verse 22, tells us that when they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So they, uh, the tables were turned and, and uh, the, you know, the proverbial snare that they set for somebody else, they themselves got caught in it. The Bible says, you know, when you roll a rock onto somebody else, it's going to roll back on you. And, and that's, that's what happens here. So, uh, they, they marveled, and then they left him, and they went their way. <clears throat> so they're stunned. That's, you know, the, the word marveled there means that they were just shocked uh, because they couldn't believe that Jesus was telling God's people to go on giving their financial support to this heathen government. This just didn't sit well with them. They, he's telling us to give our tax money to somebody who would act like their God and demand worship and build temples and oppress God's chosen people doesn't make sense and yet Jesus is telling us to do that <clears throat> is that what he wants then to support evil governments and world systems and just passively go along with what has been given for us to do and Jesus here would say well yeah if it's taxes yeah pay your taxes um, I want you to as we close here contrast the amount of time and effort and again we don't know exactly how long they deliberated for to come up with this question 
But I want you to contrast that amount of time, whatever it was, and the effort they, they put forth, uh, a whole group of men, by the way, to just concoct for themselves the perfect question. And contrast that with the amount of time and effort it took Jesus to answer the question. They have to retreat into a private quarters and convene with uh, even people they don't get along with. And they're like, okay, what if we sent the disciples to, because we can't go back there. We know where that goes. So you guys, you need to go. So we need a question. What, what are you going to ask him? Ask him something about taxes. That would be good. You know who we should bring with? Let's get the Herodians. Hey, guys, Herodians, we're going to send you guys, and we'll ask him about taxes. Like, what does he think? Like, don't just butter him up a little bit. Give him some flattery, and then ask him what he thinks about taxes. So, you know, an hour or two of discussion. And then they come, and they unload on Jesus, and he goes, God, you guys are hypocrites. Give me a coin. Yeah, give it to him then. Done. Jesus just answers the question. Didn't confer with anybody, didn't take time to think about it. He just answers it. And, and if you just want to know how profound his answer was, his reply would go on with just a moment's notice off the top of his head. He answers in such a way that that answer that we have in our Bible here would become the basis for all future discussion on the problem of state versus church. Right? Because that's the big issue. We still talk about it today. Church and state, church and state, where's the line? And Jesus goes, I told you 2,000 years ago, Christians are to live within governments without a problem, shouldn't be a problem, still worshiping the Lord. If there's ever a conflict, you don't separate church and state. You go on being obedient to God while being submissive to your government. If and when they conflict... You pick God. That's how that works. Well, but we need to separate them so that we can stay safe and we can worship in peace. Maybe, maybe not. We were never guaranteed the freedom to worship in peace. What does our Constitution say? That Constitution is worldly. The Bible says that the worshipers of Jesus Christ are risking their lives in some contexts. So that's, that's what Jesus is saying here didn't take him long to deliberate and come up with a, an answer. Life's toughest questions are no problem to Jesus. He is, the Bible says, the living Word of God. Jesus is the living Word of God. And did you know that the Word of God, and that would be the embodiment of Christ there, the Word of God contains <clears throat> all things pertaining to life, <clears throat> and godliness. And that tells us that there's no question that Jesus can't answer. There's no riddle that he can't solve and no dilemma he can't fix, whether it be about the government or, or personal matters, anything that you face in life. Jesus has proven it time and time again. He's got the answers. But for those who won't receive the counsel he offers them, they're no different than these disciples of the Pharisees. They are wicked hypocrites. And again, in verse 22, you remember how they marveled. It's sad, really, that they marveled. What they should have done was repent. I wish verse 22 says when they heard these words, they repented. But it doesn't say that. It just says they were really surprised. They marveled because they didn't, they didn't repent. Okay, hear me on this. They didn't repent. What, what that means is that the tax issues they had before Jesus gave the best answer ever, they, they still had them after he gave the answer. Tax issues would continue to be their bane, a, 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 a source of division in the religious community. It would, it would go on to be a, a great issue of conflict in their country. Uh, there's a Jewish historian named Josephus. I bring his name up every once in a while, not because I read him regularly, but because he's quoted regularly. Okay, Josephus is a Jewish historian that really in great detail recorded many of the events in and around the time of Christ. And he records how in 66 AD, so this is now some three and a half decades after Christ's crucifixion, 66 AD, the zealots, remember who they were, the zealots got all worked up about the tax issue again and attempted another revolt. 
Now, if they would have repented in verse 22, this wouldn't have happened. But they didn't repent. They marveled. And so it's only a few decades later. They're getting all worked up again. And they, they uh, attempt another revolt, which resulted in the notorious Roman siege and subsequent destruction of Jerusalem four years later in 70 A.D. If you've been around the church and you've heard me teach and you've read anything, you know that 70 A.D. is a significant year. That's when the temple was burned to the ground and, and Rome ran, just sacked Jerusalem. You know why? Because they were getting all amped up about taxes and started to revolt and they had to put down the... Way to go, guys. You know, that, when Jesus confronts you and gives you a plain answer to, to a dilemma that you're facing, a, a spiritual, moral, life problem, and, and you ignore the answer Jesus gives, this is what the future holds. Now, here's a, a rather charming side note. Among Jesus' disciples, you know, he had 12 at this point, <clears throat> among them was one that got saved from that empty political life. You know what his name was? His name was Simon. Not Simon Peter, but Simon they called the Zealot. He was part of that political faction. He was part of that bad boy club. Might have been a, a relative, actually, of Judas of Galilee, the guy from 6 AD. We don't know that. But he was a Zealot, and he had been in his life caught up in a just the political drama, far away from real, true spiritual living, and he was caught up in all of this over here, and Jesus then found him and called him out of that life and trained him to think differently and taught Simon to rearrange his priorities and make better ones than this political sidetrack. And guess what? In 66 AD, when, when the zealots, his former associates, got amped up about taxes and started another revolt. It was at approximately that same time, that same year, while the zealots were starting another revolt and getting themselves killed over taxes in Israel, Simon the Christian, the former zealot, guess where he was? He was in a foreign country getting himself killed for preaching the gospel. Now I ask you this, he would have died either way at approximately the same time. 66 AD, roughly, whether he would have given his life to Christ or not. He either would have died as a zealot or died as a Christian. He either would have died because he was just amped up about taxes or he could have died because he was amped up about the gospel. He died because he was spreading the gospel. Um, which one do you think was the better cause? Right? Which cause are you going to die for? Let's say your death date is already written in stone and God's not going to change that. It's not a matter of when you die. It's a matter of why you die. You're either going to die because of sin or you're going to die because of righteousness. It's one or the other. Which do you think is the better choice? I know what we'd all say. It's righteousness for sure, pastor. But which one are you picking? Are you in the will of God and are you following God and are you listening to the answers that he's giving you concerning life's toughest questions? Or are we just going about our business and when he gives us answers we don't like, we ignore them and go about our daily routine only in time, when it comes time to die, find ourselves long, long away from and far, far out of the will of God. Because we're just like these guys. We go to Jesus with tough questions. Maybe with a different heart than they did, but nonetheless, we go to Jesus with some questions concerning, concerning life's tough issues. And what makes us a lot like them sometimes is that we don't really like the answer that we get. And like them, we are shocked. And that's it. We're offended and we go away. Because we came to Jesus wanting him to endorse a position we already held. Do you agree with us, Jesus, about taxes? Or do you agree with us about taxes? <laughs> no, I don't agree with you at all. Our life sometimes is more about proving Jesus wrong than admitting that he's right. We're no different trying to find an excuse for ourselves, trying to 
<clears throat> silence him, snuff out our conscience and go on with, with life. Sometimes life is tough, not, not because it's, it has to be that way, it's just that we make it that way. So I ask you this morning, <clears throat> if that's you, here's where it all comes down to, you know, like, think about it now, think about the sermon now. Time to consider, right? Is this you? You getting distracted by things in life that are missing the point entirely? Like taxes, really? That's what gets you up in bed? That's what gets you up in the morning? That's, that's what your fight is all about? Like you're going you're gonna to really beat the IRS. And maybe that's you. This is a long shot. I've never heard of anybody in this church at this point anyway, you know, really being trying to duck, duck the government and dodge and not pay taxes. If it is you, you have some repenting to do. But if it's not, let's not pretend that this same issue can't bleed over into other areas of our life. You get distracted with things that are totally missing the point. I mean, what's, what's making your life so difficult right now? Is your life tough? Then what's making it so tough? If it's not taxes, if it's not government, politics, world affairs, financial woes, maybe it's because the bottom line is that just like these guys... You're just trying to keep Jesus quiet. He's been telling you for some time, this is what you need to do. Your life needs to look different. You need to step forward. And you're like, well, but what? You know, here's a yes or no question for you. <sighs> Bide your time and try and drag your feet a little bit more. And like the Pharisees and the Herodians and the Zealots, <clears throat> you're religious, yes. But you don't want Jesus around anymore. If you're honest, You'd rather he keep quiet about what he has to say in your life. Okay, just something for you to think about. Is your life aligned with God's word? Is it? Are you in harmony with God's spirit? Are you? Would you listen to the answers he's giving you in life if he were standing here today? with answers to give. If you resonate with this and you think, well, yeah, I, I am throwing questions at Jesus to make excuses so that I can not change, well, then are you ready for that to stop? That's, that's the next question. If you see yourself in this account, then you need to go, well, <clears throat> Am I ready to quit being that way and get my life figured out? Am I ready to face Christ and ask him what he thinks about this area of my life? Because you might not like what he has to say. You might already know what he's trying to say, but you won't listen. And it ain't getting better. Right? It didn't get better for these guys. It got worse and worse and worse, and then they, they were annihilated. Okay, well, is that, are you ready for that then? Because that's where this goes. We need to quit questioning Jesus about frivolous things that are side issues and get to the root of the matter. If you need more answers and you want more answers, then you need to surrender yourself to the answers you've already got. Jesus has them. He's got the answers to life's toughest questions. Are we willing to ask them? Sometimes we don't want to hear what he says. Are we willing to ask them? And when he gives us an answer, are we willing to listen? They weren't. Oh, well. But they're long gone. You're alive now. What will you do?